Welcome to the Personal Innovation Podcast, brought to you by PersonalInnovationHub.com. This podcast is all about igniting dreams, passions, careers, and social impact. The objective is for us all to master our inner gifts, create our own future, and live our lives as a love story while leaving a dent on the universe. And now, here's your host, Eric Suryram. Hello, Univision family, and welcome to the Startup Learning Zone edition of your Motivational Personal Innovation Podcast with me, Eric Sayram, your personal innovation evangelist and future careers coach. This podcast is brought to you by personalinnovationhub.com, the place you want to go if you're looking for inspiration and guidance to create a future-proof career and use it to impact the world. Remember, in today's economy, small is the new big. If you're a startup entrepreneur or have an idea you want to start, this is an episode for you. If you love this episode, you can share with friends who need to hear and also feel free to email me at coaching at personalinnovationhub.com. Please also do review or rate this podcast on iTunes. It will help us reach more people. In this episode, I feature a social enterprise startup technology business called Dex technology stay tuned in. so michael you're welcome to the personal innovation podcast oh, thank you very much great can you tell us a bit more about yourself okay so um firstly my name is michael asante frifa um i'm the co-founder and ceo of dex technology uh and you know i grew up in a small town new, called new tafo where i learned everything pretty much everything that i know now and I'm super excited to be here and to be on your podcast. Um, so, yeah. Sure. Great. That's, that's powerful. I'm so ex- excited about this episode already. Uh, Michael seems to be a very lively person and I'm um, thinking that my listeners will enjoy this episode to the max. Michael, this podcast is all about igniting dreams, passions, careers, and social impacts. Mm-hmm. What do you think about my podcast and what impact it seeks to have on my audience? You know, you know I, th- I think what's very interesting ab- about what you're doing is that the, there, is, there isn't enough of, of such a thing going on here in Ghana because most, most people are out there doing a lot, a lot of very, very interesting things, but none of these people are being heard. So just going around and then listening to our stories and then telling that out to people is for me very unique in the sense that one of the things that I personally cherish is is storytelling and the fact the fact that and well its influence on on people because when people know when people have a narrative they're able to you know tune their minds and then actually feel a little more confident about themselves, you know, in terms of the ability to do things. So, yeah, I think it's that's, really that's interesting. Powerful. Tell us, since infancy, what have been your dream? What, what have you dreamt becoming since infancy? Huh, this, this is an interesting question. Um, so, I guess, naturally, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who is just interested in knowing how things work. And so... Since infancy, all I have been doing is breaking things and then trying to find out what makes them tick. So I actually remember a time when I was almost killed by my dad's car because I needed to see what was inside the radio that made it talk to us all the time. So back then, I was about six or seven. I didn't have a screwdriver. And so the only way that I knew how to open something was to drop it on the ground and then break it. So I just... Just as my dad was moving out of his driveway, I rushed into into his 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 pathway and I dropped the the whole the whole radio set there, expecting that he would run over it, open it, and then I'd be able to see what's inside there. Wow! <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's so. Uh, how do I call it? It's so powerful. I I know. So I guess you know, since childhood, I have just been into how things work all the time. I recall I, I never had any toys, not because it was not bought for me, but because I broke all of them. And then I tried to, you know, repurpose them one way or another. So, you know, it, it made me learn a lot of things. And, well, along the line, I wanted to be a doctor, but, you know, 
the whole blood thing didn't work for me. So. All right, so let's fast track to today. What is your passion today? Creation, creativity, I guess would be what my passion, my passion is right now. What I want to see is in Ghana is, is a country that is able to fend for itself in terms of industrialization. Um, I have a degree in mechanical engineering and you know, I'd call it a side degree in electrical engineering. It's, it's not really there, but yeah. I do a lot of electrical engineering. Um, so I see that the knowledge of industrialization or industrialization is a powerful thing for the country or any country that wants to develop. And so I think that if we could drive this home to everybody, then we have a better chance of succeeding as a country. And so everything that I have been doing so far is just in the line of getting the mindsets of people within that wavelength so that everybody can start thinking along that line in terms of the ability to make wow. and industrialize. This, this, this topic is very interesting. I'm, I'm so uh, much interested in the topic or the concept of industrialization. Mm-hmm. Do you think... Ghana as a country have done enough to industrialize our nation. You know, back in the day, I would say yes, a lot was done, but that slowed down and has almost come to a, a stop. You know, go to Swami now. You know, the things that they used to do in the past is what they're still doing now, but new ways of manufacturing have have arrived and they are all all over the place we haven't adopted any of these things and so you know you'd still see them using chisels and hammers and then doing the same old thing that they were taught way 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 back ago long long back ago and i think that that stopped we need we need to we need to push harder what do you think would take africa to that level where we say that africa is uh, being moved to the level of industrialization or we have industrialized Africa to that extent where we are comparing or we could compare ourselves to Europe, for instance? I think, I honestly think that it's, it's a mindset, right? I feel that we do not believe in our ability to create enough. We don't think that we are capable of matching what is out there. We don't think that we can take somebody else's technology and make it better, all right? And that is what I feel is influencing, it's just what is influencing us right now. We don't feel that we can do it. And so um, in, in, in our local parlance, we say, Kwesi Brunidio Ebefo. But then, you know, we have the capacity to do that if we set our minds to it. We just need to reorient our thinking and then we'll, we'll have the capacity. We'll, we'll just be able to do all of these things. Wow. Powerful. What do you think about our educational system and how it is working to train uh, industrial-minded or production-minded, technologically savvy uh, uh, graduates uh, who will empower our system, make sure that they're creating the, the jobs, the businesses that will power the engine of technology, the engine of production, the engine of industrialization for the countries in Africa. To that, I would say we have, we have done something, but it's, it's just not enough. It's not comparable to the things that have to be done in order to get people who are thinking along those lines. What steps do you think our schools should take? Well, I, our policy makers to start taking to make sure that we are getting to that level. I, I think that our school system should be um, more of hands-on than theory. I mean, a good balance of theory and hands-on is it's preferred above all. But what we have now is just a theoretical system where you you're 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 taught to to know the book. And then afterwards, write a standardized, standardized test that you know rates you as a like a, a good candidate or not. Whether or not you can actually perform. perform no, nobody knows. 
Because it's just about passing. Yeah, it's just about passing. You get a first class, a second class, or a second class lower, and then you, you're good to go. Before we, we go down to desk technology, your organization, let's finalize on this topic of industrialization. Okay. And bring in somebody who is doing something like Kantanka. Uh, what do you think about this man who is creating uh, certain products in Ghana? Um, his efforts and what do you think should be done in order to make that effort yield some fruits for our nation? Mm, okay, that, this is really <laughs> this is a really good question. Uh, almost dicey. But my take, my personal take, and other people might have different opinions, but I think that maybe Osofo Kantanka should um, maybe refocus his his attention. It's great technology that he's 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 doing, but I feel to a certain extent as a tech person a little alienated because it it doesn't seem to really, really tackle some of our issues. You know, something like a car, great. But you know, a lot of us are in trotros. So you know, something so along those lines. What is the lines. use of innovation when people cannot really use it? When the masses cannot get access and make use of it and use it to solve their daily problems? It has no use then. Is that what you want to say about uh, the technology that has been explored or been implemented? No, I, I wouldn't. No, that's not what I'm saying about his technology okay. or. You know, a car is good. You know, a car is good technology, right? But when you're designing huge cars that the ordinary Ghanaian cannot purchase, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> don't worry. Let me not put you there. Yeah. <laughs> now let's come down to desk technologies. So you have a passion of creating. You have you had a dream, and you went through that stage where you were actually breaking things and fixing them back to the st state where you went to school to study. Yeah. And uh, because of the passion, the burning desire is still there. Mm -hmm. And you started something about it. Yes, one pe somebody will start, sit at home after school and say, I want government to create a job for me. Yeah. Uh, or the jobs are not there. Mm -hmm. So let's form an um, association of unemployed graduates. I know. Right. But you took an action. Tell us about that. So, firstly, the thing that really hit me was when I was in first, second year, and a final, final year student, electrical engineering, came to me and asked me for help with his project, final year project. And then I asked myself, hey, if my final year student is coming to me for his work, then what are they doing up there? What am I going to do in my final year? You know? That was troubling because that guy is going to go out and then he has to, you know, take on a job and then do something, you know. And it was disturbing for me. But, you know, I did it because of the cash, you know. But then it just dawned on me that uh, there is something inherently wrong with the way that our educational system is. Okay, and so we we took it upon ourselves to try and solve that. And the only way that we, we felt was um, sustainable enough was to tackle it from the grassroots, from the GHS, from the primary, where they actually have the, the option to choose. Because honestly, GHS is where you choose what your life is about. You know, if you decide to offer science, then it's science for you throughout until you decide to change. But then it should be a decision. Otherwise, you'll become a square peg in a round, in a round hole. Yes. Exactly. And honestly, I feel that a lot of parents want their, their students to pursue science because it has a certain level of prestige. But then as they go through school and then as they, they you know, go through the science curriculum, they start scoring bad marks because, you know, the, the science doesn't seem um, practical enough for them. And so they, they just start blowing it and their parents go like, okay, then choose a different option. So what we did was we went to my co-founder's hometown with a bunch of LEDs and resistors and capacitors. And then we taught 
them how to build simple circuits, how to, how to light up their own houses. And it was interesting to see what the children did. Because at the end of the day, all of our LEDs would be stolen. All right? Initially, we thought they were just stealing them and then never bringing them back. But they actually brought whatever they did back. And then they showed that to us. Like, oh, sir, this is what I've done. And it was interesting because the children wanted to create something. They wanted to do something. It just, it just felt like they didn't have the necessary tools to do that. And so, long story short, we decided, how do we scale that from, you know, just us going around and then giving children these things to the, the level where it is accessible by every Ghanaian student in the primary or GHS. And so, that is how the science set was born. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, Dex Technologies is into creating, what solution? we into creating STEM solutions that allow the ease of teaching and learning, you know, STEM-related subjects like science. So, so I can I can say that this technologies is is a education support or education oriented organization, a technology based organization, or you are supporting uh, technology or you are creating technology to facilitate learning. Yes. We are creating powerful. technology to facilitate learning. Learning. Yeah. That's powerful. That's powerful. So what is the product? What are you designing? How will you de- define what the solution you're creating is? Describe it to my audience so they can appreciate what really this technologies is doing. What we really have done is, is taking a science lab and then with design, we have shrunk that lab into something that can fit into the backpack of a student and also fit on their desk, allowing them to have access to a lab right on their desk. So we call it the the science set. It contains components that allow students to perform science experiments that are inside of their syllabus right at their desk, eliminating the, the need to build very, very expensive laboratories. Wow, this, this is powerful because if in my village uh, where I come from, if there's no science lab uh, with equipment and tools provided by government, then my students in this, or people in this uh, school in my village can assess this box or this tool, uh, put it in their backpack, yeah, and experiment with it. Exactly. Practically, Practically learn with it. Mm-hmm be able to do things exactly. with their hands. With yeah. it. That's so powerful. So what's interesting is, is the fact that most labs, okay, that are with the GHS and primary schools that do have labs, there is just this um, atmosphere about it where you're not really allowed to touch anything because if you do, you break it, and then somebody is, is going to get chastised for that broken thing. And so, Meanwhile, how you learned was really broken. Exactly. That's how I learned. But then right. you're not allowed to do that, okay, because it's expensive, and then they don't want it broken. So you enter a lab, and it, the lab looks like, oh, did you just set this thing up? And it's like, no, it's been here for a decade. And it looks really new because nobody's used anything inside of it. Okay, so what we have done is giving taking that and then giving it to the child because if the child breaks something within his own science set, it's his fault, all right? Nobody's going to wave a cane over his head or, or chastise him or no teacher is going to get in trouble if a student burns his LED. And that's how children will learn if we give them that opportunity to just experiment freely, you know? And that's, that's all that the science set is about. So you have a technology, or you have an idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you went through the ideation process. Yes. How did you validate this idea to know that, yes, this is something that will work, this is something that will be appreciated by our target audience, this is something that if we start talking about it, people will buy into it. How did you go through that validation process? Okay. Um, so... Firstly, there, there are a number of things that you, we had to rule out. Parents in Ghana were not willing to buy toys for their children because they were sending them to school and they needed them to pass the exam, which is something that every parent wants for their child. So if you presented them with something that 
was a toy, right, and had no ties to, to the educational system, they would, they would outright not purchase that. So we decided that we'd weave the science sets into the curriculum so that it is now something that the student needs in order to pass the exam. If your parent asks you, will this appear in your exam? You can confidently, as a child, say yes, even though maybe you just want something to experiment with. But it will definitely appear within your exam. And so that was the first thing that we had to do. And so we built our first prototype around the curriculum, making sure that when a teacher saw the science set, he would immediately understand how the science set would make his teaching easy and how it facilitates the way that students learn. So, so innovation family, if you have an idea, think about how this idea integrates into an existing set of policies or systems. They have an idea to create something, but they thought about the fact that if you're creating something and the culture of the people do not fall in sync with what you're creating, yeah. it will not be bought. It, it will not be appreciated. So they uh, they considered the culture mm -hmm. of the people. The fact that our parents uh, want really uh, success in education. And that, what that means is passing your exams. Mm -hmm. They are not ready to buy uh, toys. But they were ready to buy something that integrates into the curriculum. So yes, they considered how this tool that they are creating can fall or integrate with the curriculum. And that is what they did. And that's powerful. Yeah. Can you go on with the next stage that you took to validate the idea? Okay, so once we had, we had established that point, we took the syllabus and went through the syllabus from page one to the end and then just took out the experiments that were in there. And then what we did was, there, there are bigger versions out there, but we, we reduced it and then, continuously I treated till it was small enough to fit on their desk because what, it was one of the factors that we considered. And then also we made sure that it was affordable enough for parents to be able to buy because parents were not willing to spend more than you know, what they would normally spend on an average textbook for their child. So we had to make sure that it was affordable enough for them to and once we were done with that, we, we took our first prototype, which was, you know, it was nothing to write home about, to, to be honest. But we sent it out there to, we actually went to Accra, to one of, one of the schools, I can't really recall their name. I think it was high class. Anyway, but we went there, we demonstrated it to the teachers and then some of the students. And right there and then, a teacher wanted to purchase. They just asked us, how much, how much does this cost? Because they could immediately see how useful it was for them and how the children had reacted to performing a, a simple experiment because now they could see an LED. They had seen it in their textbooks since childhood and now they could actually see it work for real. And they were super excited. They were extra confident. They were asking their teachers questions. Wow, this, this is so powerful because the first point I picked out is that uh, if you have an idea, ask yourself, does it really matter? And cut off the fluff. Ask yourself, what is really needed? And cut out all other areas that do not, uh, and cut it down, niche down to that level where, yes, people can really resonate with it, people can really buy it. And now, take the idea to people who really need it mm -hmm. and experiment, check out. What and the reaction they gave you it, it was, was powerful. It was, it, it was beyond us because as of that time, we had not even put, we had not even set a price for, for the set. And so the teachers were just asking us to, to sell to, as a matter, somebody wanted to buy what we had and it was just a single prototype. Somebody just wanted that. So for us, it was a defining moment. And then we decided that, okay, we're going to spend our, our time on this, we're going to to dedicate um, the rest of the our lives to making sure that every student can have something All right, like that. Great. Let's let's move to the production stage. Y yes, you have a prototype. You validated the idea. Now 
take us through what you went through to make sure that you are producing. First of all, how was all this funded? Oh, oh. <laughs> that's very interesting. You know, um, so back then I was offering my national service and so most of the money that I got from national service is what I put into um, starting with my co-founder. So it was the early stages, we had to bootstrap a, a lot. We, whatever money we could scrape from normal jobs that would do. Um, back then I used to do projects for people and such. So national service projects and such, and it would, would accumulate all of that money and then invest it into the company. So bootstrapping was start how from actually where started. you actually Start from where you are, use what you have. Uh, don't start complaining about how there's no money. Uh, stop complaining about how the systems are not arranged in your favor and start doing something now. Start creating using what you really have today. That's powerful. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's really helpful if you start to leverage on the skills that you already have to, to make some cash and then you can actually invest it into whatever new idea that you have. So that's, that's how we, we started. And it was tough. But we had to push on because honestly, right after our prototyping, a school placed an order for 20 sets. And oh. as of that, we did not have any production line whatsoever. So we had to set up and then keep experimenting with materials because at that time, there was no, there was no money. So we couldn't go outside the country or actually even find somebody within the country to manufacture for us because no cash. So we had to we had to get innovative and then find creative ways to make our science set and then still be able to sell sell those. So whatever little money that we, we had, what I did was I took industrial processes and then I stripped them down to their barest minimum so that we could replicate those processes here with the, the the most minimum, and most minimum is almost too exaggerating, but with minimum um, tools and, and, and um, machining. So, so necessarily, what will even happen is that your overhead costs will be minimized because you're not doing the very uh, excessive, elaborate manufacturing process. Exactly, really? exactly. Wow, so how are you producing today? What is the process? Take us through the process of production. Okay, so now we, we are a little stable and so we're able to outsource some of the the work that we have to do to other manufacturers here in Ghana. And so it's production is basically divided into three packaging, plastics and e electronics. So packaging is um outsourced to a company here in Ghana. We also do a bit of the packaging here in, on, our, on our factory floor. Plastics, we also do here. We mainly laser cut and then 3D print our plastics. And then electronics, we're still using the strip down process that um, we, we started with. So we're still using that as our production method for electronics. Powerful. Now, you, you had a vision. Uh, you started experimenting with uh, things that you'll see around since infancy, breaking them and all that. Yeah. Um, and then how did you come by your co-founder uh, to bring him on the team? How, how was the team building process like? Okay, okay. So huh, how do I tell the story? Great. So the, my co-founder I met in, in a group back then we called the creativity group. It was a student group on campus. You know, school got a little some way for me because it 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 so it turned out that a lot of the things that we're doing were theory based and I'm I'm not that kind of person. I just can't learn if everything is theory. I had to get my hands dirty and creativity group was a place to do that. So over there we had really smart people who felt the same way about the educational system coming together and then trying to do cool things that you know they felt would change the society and so that's where I met my co-founder his name is Charles that's where we actually met and we were friends from that time until we actually started you know next technology 
powerful. So let's talk about marketing. How are you going about marketing, branding, uh, and all the other new technologies, uh, uh, new mediums of marketing? How are you doing that to spread the news, to uh, send your vision across, to let people know about the good, uh, get the good news? Okay, about what so we are doing this very strategically to, to ensure that we are not overwhelmed because it's something that can easily collapse uh, a startup if you you end up, especially a hardware startup, because you know if you if you don't manage all of that very well, you're going to have a few issues. And so we do have a, a three pronged approach to to marketing. What we're doing is we're tackling from the government um, end where we're trying to secure. Uh, government funding and government contract because you know the the government owns a lot of the schools so if they they buy into the whole science set then the the chances of getting every student one is it's it's pretty good so are you tackling this from a, a b to c angle or b to b what is the focus is it to the schools, to government, to other uh, donor agencies, organizations who are interested in, or stakeholders in education, or you're targeting parents of students or the students okay, so themselves? Which, which is right, the focus? So that, to ensure that we are covering all angles, we, we're taking it along these three-pronged efforts. So there's a the, there's the government, because the government can purchase for the schools, thus making it a B2B. We also, we also tackle... We actually go directly to the schools and demonstrate to them and then actually sell to them also B2B. And then we also go directly to parents and then to the PTA meetings and appeal to them to buy for their children. So making that a B2C. So we, we're making sure that we've covered all our ends so that, you know, which, whichever brings revenue, we can, we can actually collect revenue from all these angles because managing a hardware startup is pretty tough. So... If you don't cover all of those, <laughs> yeah. When all is said and done, what is the social impact that you want to have? What impact, what dent do you want to leave on the universe? When all is said and done, when uh, perhaps you are even no more, what do you want the world to say about you and about this technology? I, I, w I simply want to be named as one of the people who spearhead the transformation of science and technology in Ghana and Africa and the world. And then for DEX technology, what we really seek to do is to one day create or bring up students who are confident in the ability to make, to create, to build. You know, scientists who are of, you know, it's it's hard to describe in words, but we want very confident people who, when they see a problem, they're not going to talk. They're just, they're just not going to talk about oh, there's a problem. But you know, just go straight to solving that problem instead of talking about it. You know, this is what we really want Powerful. to do. What what final words of wisdom, wisdom nuggets, do you have to share with people who like you, who are home and they are listening to this podcast and they're thinking? I have an idea. How can I start? I want to create a career to impact the world. How can I start? What can I start doing? What advice do you have for these people? Quickly. You just have to start. You know, take what you have now, leverage on that, and then use that as a, as a starting point. Innovation family, it looks like just start now has become an anthem for every episode. And if you're not listening, then there's something wrong with you. Start today. Michael, thank you very much for coming on the Personal Innovation Podcast. It's been exciting having you on, and we look forward to having you do greater things, and we'll get back to you and thank interview you very again. Much. Powerful. Remember to subscribe, because there's more to come. Follow Eric on Twitter at Sir Eric Suryram A and on Facebook, facebook.com slash personal innovation hub. Remember to rate and review the show. Share this with friends who need to hear.